Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'm pleased to have with us uh, Hugh Raffles this afternoon. Uh, Hugh uh, is a professor and chair of anthropology at the New School. Uh, and he's also the author of In Amazonia, A Natural History, for which he received the Victor Turner Prize in Ethnographic Writing. Um, and his work in general addresses human concepts of nature and the relationship between humans, animals, and, uh, and other non-humans. Uh, and his most recent book is Insectopedia, which is a collection of 26 chapters, one for each letter of the alphabet, in which he considers insects and our cultural relation to them. Uh, moving from cricket fighting in China to dances of bees, uh, from insects at 15,000 feet to fighting fruit flies, he's written a very engaging exploration of our relationship to the physical world. So please join me in welcoming Hugh Raffles. Thanks. Thanks very much, Simon. It's, it's great to be here. I'm um, very happy to be um, inside Google. Um, it's really an interesting experience. And thank you very much for bringing me here. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the book, tell you a little bit about it. Um, then I'm going to read some, a few sections. And then hopefully we'll have time for some conversation afterwards. So um, as Simon said, this is a, this is a, um, a, book, about, a book about insects and about human relationships to insects. And it's very wide ranging. It covers, it's historical, goes back to the 15th century and before. There's actually some, some um, it actually takes us right back to Aristotle in the Western tradition. Um, and it, but it also is based around, it also has quite a bit about um, field work, which I've done in, in different places. I'm an anthropologist, and I like to travel and meet people in, in a whole range of places. Then that's represented in the book. Um, and as I said, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm not an entomologist. And when I started working on the book, I actually didn't know very much about insects at all. Um, I didn't pay them a lot of attention, except when they forced their way into my life, as they're inclined to do in, in New York apartments, which is what I live in. And I certainly didn't understand them. They seemed completely mysterious. Apart from mosquitoes, I didn't really have much of an idea of what, even what they wanted. But insects are fascinating, and they took me over. The more time I spent set, um, studying them, the more, the more interested I got in them. They're powerful, they're dangerous, they're beautiful, mysterious, they're difficult, and much more. And I discovered they're often at the center of very fascinating worlds, worlds that wouldn't exist without them. An insect collector that I met in Tokyo, a man called Daisaburo Okamoto, told me that insect lovers are anarchists. And I think that he meant that he loved these impossible, unmanageable creatures because they're, because they're impossible and unmanageable, not despite the fact that they are. And I, le I learned a lot from spending time with people like him who thought deeply about insects and about their place in our lives. Insects live in a completely different world from us, and it's one that we pay very little attention to. But if we do, do start to look, to listen, and to shift our sense of scale, as many of the people that I write about do, we enter a universe that can dramatically enrich the one that most of us normally occupy. And that's, that's the theme that this book starts with. It describes how scientists in the 1920s tried to find out something about the lives of insects who were invading cotton crops in the US South. They sent up planes to see, if they could, to see what they could find out about insect migration. And as, as I'll try to describe in this passage, they found a lot more than they bargained for. There were only a few flies and wasps in that first trap at Tallulah. But over the next five years, the researchers flew more than 1,300 sorties from the Louisiana airstrip, and they captured tens of thousands more insects in altitudes ranging from 20 to 15,000 feet. They generated a long series of charts and tables, cataloging individual insects of 700 named species according to height at which they were collected, the time of day, the wind speed and direction, the temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, dew point, and many other physical variables. They already knew something about long distance dispersal. They'd heard about butterflies, gnats, water striders, leaf bugs, book lice, and katydids sighted hundreds of miles out on the open ocean. About the aphids that Captain William Parry had encountered on ice flows during his polar expedition of 1828. And about those other aphids that in 1925 made the 800 mile journey across the frigid, windswept Barents Sea in just 24 hours. Still, they were taken aback by the enormous quantities of animals they were discovering in the air above Louisiana, and unashamedly astonished by the heights at which they found them. All of a sudden, it seems, the heavens had opened. They estimated that at any given time of day, on any given day throughout the year, the air column rising from 50 to 14,000 feet 
above one square mile of Louisiana countryside contained an average of 25 million insects and perhaps as many as 36 million. They found ladybugs at 6,000 feet during the daytime, striped cucumber beetles at 3,000 during the night. They collected three scorpion flies at 5,000 feet, 31 fruit flies between 200 and 3,000, a fungus gnat at 7,000 feet, and another at 10,000. They trapped an anthrax transmitting horse fly at 200 feet, and another at 1,000. They caught wingless worker ants as high as 4,000 feet, and 16 species of parasitic wasps at altitudes up to 5,000 feet. At 15,000 feet, probably the highest elevation at which any specimen has ever been taken above the surface of the earth, they wrote, they trapped a ballooning spider, a feat that reminded them of spiders thought to have navigated the globe on the trade winds, and led one of them to write that the young of most, most spiders are more or less addicted to this mode of transportation. An image of excited little animals packing their luggage that opened a small rupture in the consensus around the passivity of all this airborne movement and led to a subsequent observation that ballooning spiders not only climb up to an exposed site, a twig, twig or a flower, for instance, stand on tiptoe, raise their abdomen, test the atmosphere, throw out silk filaments, and launch themselves into the blue, or free legs spread eagled, but that they also use their bodies and their silk to control their descent and the location of their landing. 36 million little animals flying unseen above one square mile of countryside. The heavens opened. The air column was a vault of insect-laden air from which fell a continuous rain. So stop. If you're inside, go to a window. Throw it open and turn your face to the sky. All that empty space, the deep vastness of the air, the heavens wide above you. The sky is full of insects and all of them are going somewhere. Every day, above and around us, the collective voyage of billions of beings. Well, that's, that sense of, sort of sense of mystery about um, there being worlds around us that we're, not, that we're not at all familiar with is one of the themes that continues through the book. But quite a lot of the book is based on, as I said, on field research that I've done in various places. And I spend a few of the most enjoyable weeks that I had in writing this book in Shanghai. And one of, my chapters in one of the chapters in here is about people there who train and fight crickets, and people who have a deep knowledge about crickets. Cricket fighting in China has a history that goes back nearly a thousand years, and I go into some detail about this in the book. And the part that I want to read you describes some of what I learned from a very experienced cricket trainer that I met there, a man called Master Feng, who was a director of a cricket museum in Qibao, which is a suburb of Shanghai. All these crickets were collected here in Qibao, says Master Feng, standing behind a table laden with hundreds of gray clay pots, each containing one fighting male, and in some cases, its female sex partner. Chibao's crickets were famous throughout East Asia, he tells us, a product of the township's rich soil. But since the fields here were built on in the year 2000, crickets have been harder to find. Master Fung's two white uniformed assistants fill the insects' miniature water bowls with pipettes, and we humans all drink pleasantly astringent tea made from his recipe of seven medicinal herbs. Master Fung has considerable presence, the brim of his white canvas hat rakishly angled, his jade pendant and rings, his intense gaze, his animated storytelling, his throaty laugh. Michael, my translator, and I are drawn to him immediately and hang on his words. Master Fung is a cricket master, confides his assistant, Miss Zhao. He has 40 years experience. There's no one more than crickets. 20 years ago, everyone tells us, before the construction of the new Shanghai gobbled up the landscape, in a time when city neighborhoods were patchworks of fields and houses, people lived more intimately with animal life. Many found companionship in cicadas or other musical insects that they kept in bamboo cages and slim pocket, bo pocket boxes. And young people, not just the middle-aged, played crickets, learning how to recognize the three races and 72 personalities, how to judge a likely champion, how to train the fighters to their fullest potential, how to use the pencil-thin brushes made of yard grass or mouse whisker to stimulate the insect's jaws and provoke them to combat. They learned the rudiments of the three rudiments around which every cricket manual is structured, judging, training, and fighting. When Master Fung and other experts tried to instruct me in the distinctions that allow them to judge the cricket's fighting potential, they used a taxonomy that first appeared in Jia Sidao's book of crickets, 
a 900-year-old manual of training and raising crickets that's been, that's been modified and supplemented, but not overthrown across the centuries. The book outlines a fearsomely complex system for classifying crickets. It begins with body color. GR identifies and ranks four colors, yellow, red, black, and white. By contrast, most cricket experts I talked to in Shanghai describe only three colors, yellow, green, and purple. Yellow crickets are reputed to be the most aggressive of the three, but not necessarily the best fighters, because green insects, though quieter, are more strategic, and according to the annual illustrated list of cricket champions, include a greater number of generals. Color is the first criterion by which crickets are divided, and it confers an initial identity that is held to correspond to differences in behavior and character. Below these gross distinctions, however, is a further set of division into individual personalities, whose total number is often put at 72. Below that, classification is based on an agglomeration of numerous physical variables, complex clusters of characters. Length, shape, and color of the insect's legs, abdomen, and wings are all systematically parsed, as is the shape of the head. Current manuals might include seven or more possibilities. And differences in number, shape, color, and width of the fight lines that run from front to back across the crown. Experts, experts also consider the energy of the antennae, the shape and color of the animal's eyebrows, which should be opposite in color to the antennae, the shape, color, translucence, and strength of the jaws, the shape and size of the neck plate, the shape and resting angle of the forewings, the sharpness of the tail tips, the hair on the abdomen, the width of the thorax and face, the thickness of the feet, and the animal's overall posture. The insect's skin must be dry, that is, it must reflect light from inside itself, not from its surface. It must also be delicate, like a baby's. The cricket's walk must be swift and easy. It should not have a rolling gait. In general, strength is more important than size. The quality of the jaws is decisive. Master Fung tells us that the trainer's task is to build on pre-existing natural virtues to develop the animal's fighting spirit. This indispensable quality is revealed only at the moment that the insect enters the arena. Though a cricket might look like a champion in all respects, though the judgment of its physical qualities may be correct, it can still turn out to lack spirit in competition. This, he insists, is less a matter of the individual cricket's character than a function of its care. It's the task of the trainer to build up the cricket's strength with foods appropriate to its growth and individual needs, to respond to its sicknesses, develop its physical skills, cultivate its virtues, overcome its natural aversion to light, and habituate it to new alien surroundings. Fundamentally, says Master Fung, a trainer must create the conditions in which the insect can be happy. A cricket knows when it is loved, and it knows when it's well cared for, and it responds in kind with loyalty, courage, obedience, and the signs of quiet contentment. In practical terms, this is a quid pro quo, because a happy cricket is amenable to trending, training, and as its health, skill, and confidence increase under the trainer's care, so too does its fighting spirit. And as he was explaining all this, describing the sexual regimen he provides, outlining the many symptoms of ill health that one must be alert to, displaying the purified water, the home-cooked foods, the various pots, explaining that everything relies on communication and that the yard grass is the bridge between him and the insect, that in other words, they understand each other in a language beyond language. Master Fung removed the lid from one of his pots and in an emphatic response to my increasingly unimaginative line of questioning, took his yard grass straw and barked orders at the cricket as if it a soldier, this way, that way, this way, that way. And the insect, to Michael's and my real astonishment, responded unhesitatingly, turning left, right, left, right. A routine of exercises that Master Fung eventually explained increases the fighter's flexibility, makes him limber and elastic, and shows that man and insect understand each other through the language of command as well as beyond it. So a significant, a significant part of the book is, involves, um, as I said, involves fieldwork in various places. But an equally large part of the book is involved with trying to think through 
the ways that we, the ways that humans think about insects and the ways that insects enter our lives in both positive and enter our psyches in both positive and negative ways. And one thing that struck me throughout working on the book was how intense are the feelings that we have about and around them. And as I said, many of the f these feelings are positive. The beauty of butterflies, the wonder of fireflies, the sweet nostalgia that can over overwhelm us with the sound of crickets or cicadas. But many are negative. And after I've written a chapter about how, how amazing bees are, particularly honeybees, I wrote this chapter, which is a short chapter I want to read to you, which is called My Nightmares. For a long time, I thought only of bees. They crowded out all the others, and this book became just for them. A book of bees and all their beeness. All the physical capacities, all the behavioral subtleties, all the organizational mysteries, all the comradeship. All that golden beeswax lighting up the ancient world, all that honey sweetening medieval Europe. All those bees, timeless templates for the most diverse human projects and ideologies. Bees took over. But then a plague of winged ants invaded my living room. And after they left, I began thinking of locusts and then beetles, all those beetles. And then caddis flies and crane flies and vinegar flies and bot flies and dragon flies and may flies and house flies and so many other flies. Then one thing led to another and I came across field crickets and mole crickets and Jerusalem crickets. And then my friend Jesse sent me a wetter from New Zealand and then the 17-year cicadas emerged in Ohio, and I discovered the thrips and the katydids, remember the aphids on California roses and the summer wasps drowning in water-filled jam jars, and then termi termites and hornets and earwigs and scorpions and ladybugs and praying mantises sold dry in packets in garden supply stores. And then there were the mosquitoes with long legs and the mosquitoes with short legs, and far too many butterflies and moths of all kinds. And I remembered what we already know, that insects are without number and without end, that in comparison, we are no more than dust, and that this is not the worst of it. There's the nightmare of fecundity and the nightmare of the multitude. There's the nightmare of uncontrolled bodies and the nightmare of inside our bodies and all over our bodies. There's the nightmare of unguarded orifices and the nightmare of vulnerable places. There's the nightmare of foreign bodies in our bloodstream and the nightmare of foreign bodies in our ears and our eyes and under the surface of our skin. There's the nightmare of swarming and the nightmare of crawling. There's the nightmare of burrowing and the nightmare of being seen in the dark. There's the nightmare of turning the overhead light on just as the carpet scatters. There's the nightmare of beings without reason and the nightmare of being unable to communicate. There's the nightmare of their being out to get us. There's the nightmare of knowing and the nightmare of non-recognition. There's the nightmare of not seeing the face. There's the nightmare of not having a face. There's the nightmare of too many limbs. There's the nightmare of all this plus invisibility. There's the nightmare of being submerged and the nightmare of being overrun. There's the nightmare of being invaded and the nightmare of being alone. There's the nightmare of numbers, big and small. There's the nightmare of metamorphosis and the nightmare of persistence. There's the nightmare of wetness and the nightmare of dryness. There's the nightmare of poison and the nightmare of paralysis. There's the nightmare of putting the shoe on and of taking the shoe off. There's the slithering nightmare and the one that walks backwards. There's the squirming nightmare and the squishing nightmare. There's the nightmare of the unwelcome surprise. There's the nightmare of the gigantic and the nightmare of becoming. There's the nightmare of being trapped in the body of another with no way out and no way back. There's the nightmare of abandonment and the nightmare of social death. There's the nightmare of rejection. There's the nightmare of the grotesque. There's the nightmare of awkward flight and the nightmare of clattering wings. There's the nightmare of entangled hair and the nightmare of the open mouth. There's the nightmare of long, probing antennae emerging from the overhaul flow, the overflow hole in the bathroom sink, or worse, the rim of the toilet. There's the nightmare of huge blank eyes. There's the nightmare of randomness in the unguarded moment. There's the nightmare of sitting down, the nightmare of rolling over, the nightmare of standing up. There's the nightmare of the military that funds nearly all basic research in insect science. The nightmare of probes into brains and razors into eyes. The nightmare that should any of this reveal the secrets of locusts swarming, of bees navigating, or of ants foraging, the secrets will beget other secrets, the nightmares other nightmares, the pupae other pupae, insects born of micro-implants, part machine, part insect insects, remote controlled, weaponized surveillance insects, moths on a mission, beetles undercover, 
not to mention robotic insects, mass-produced, mass-deployed, mass-suicide, nightmare insects. These are the nightmares that dream of coming wars, of insect wars without vulnerable central commands, forming and dispersing, congealing and dissolving, decentered, networked, of net war, of network-centric warfare, of no casualty wars, at least on our team, dreams of Osama bin Laden somewhere in a cave. These are the nightmares of invisible terrorists swarming without number, invading intimate places and unguarded moments, the nightmares of our age, nightmares of emergence, of a hive of evil, a brood of bad people, a superorganism beyond individuals swarming on their own initiative, homing in from scattered locations on various targets, and then dispersing only to form new swarms. The nightmare of language, the language of bees. Nightmare begets nightmare, swarm begets swarm, dreams beget dreams, terror begets terror. Where are the bees now? Collapsing in their colonies, gliding through their plastic mazes, sniffing out explosives, sucking up that sugar water, getting fat and weak on corn syrup, locked in little boxes at airports, sticking out their tongues on cue. Who knew the tiny critters were so smart, said the journalist. Fuzzy little sniffers. Buzz, 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 keeping us safe, helping us sleep easy at night. Mm. Thank you. So I'm happy to take um, any kinds of comments or any kind of, com any kind of conversation at all. So if I go to Shanghai, can I go to a cricket fighting arena? Could you say that again? If, if I were to go to Shanghai, could I go to a cricket battle arena and wager on some crickets? And if, you, if you went to Shanghai, could you go to a cricket fight yeah. and bet on it? Um, if you knew the right people, you could. Is, is it illegal, like dog fighting? Yeah. You know, um, gambling is illegal, so it's hard to go to, it's hard to, go to a fight at which there's gambling. Um, but, you know, if you're... If, People might, people might take you if, you if you know people who do that. But there, are, uh, there, is, uh, there is other cricket fighting. There's, um, there's cricket fighting which involves gambling, but people are also trying to promote cricket fighting without gambling, um, more as exhibition matches or to demonstrate the, you know, the, sort of the cultural sophistication of it, which, you know, as you can see, I hope, from what I read, it's a, it's a very developed, very, um, very, elab there's very elaborate um, knowledge which is, and deep knowledge which is connected with it. And so there are a lot of people who are trying to um, encourage, particularly encourage young people to be interested in that and to develop, the, to develop their, their skills in judging cricket and judging crickets and raising them and training them in a sort of in a format which is separate from, from the gambling culture, which has been associated with it actually right from the beginning. Um, I'm not sure how successful they're going to be at doing that, but they're, they're quite serious about doing it. And it means that there's, it's quite easy either to see um, exhibition matches of that kind, or else you can go to markets, um, you know, open air markets where people sell crickets, and um, people go out. You know, obviously people are there buying crickets, and you can see crickets in that in that context. And um, people have people have um, put on cricket fights there where they're just trying to show the the strengths of the crickets that they're selling. So um, they're sort of like displaying those crickets. But you know, as you can imagine, that's kind of a risk because if the cricket if the cricket loses, mm -hmm. then you know its value is going to go down. So um, there's a bit of a risk involved in that. Uh, are the crickets also used for agricultural purposes or things besides fighting? Um, not that I know of, not, not those crickets. Um, I think these crickets specifically are crickets that, are, um, that people train for fighting. But there might be, it just might not be something that I know about, yeah. yeah. Thank you. What do you think we could tell the chefs at Google to encourage them to serve more insects? <laughs> so what, what could the chefs at Google learn? Um, well, you know, what can I say? I'm vegan, so personally, I don't think we should be, we should be telling them how to cook vegetables. Um, but from what I can tell, they do that pretty well already. Um, yeah, quite a lot of people eat insects, either as, um, either as a special food and like a luxury food. Um, those are the people who I, who I met. Um, people in, in Niger who collect grasshoppers and they eat them and, and sell them. Um, but um, 
but generally, you know, generally I've, I've come through, through reading this book, reading this book, from writing this book to, um, to really like insects and include them in the, in the list of things. I wasn't really planning on eating them anyway, but now I really include them in the list of things that I don't eat. Thank you. Uh, question from VC from San Francisco. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm just curious, like when people talk about the insects world, insect worlds, uh, they often talk about them uh, as almost alien because uh, things can just be so different at that level. Can you talk about maybe the most uh, surprising or interesting or uh, unbelievable thing you've learned about um, in, in any particular insect uh, in your journey researching this book? Actually, about the insect rather about the insect rather than the relationship of the insect with a person. Um, I think actually the the part that I read you that that you have um, spiders and we can call them insects for now, but the spiders that um, actually will and these are flightless spiders, obviously, that will or that have circumnavigated the globe in the air currents. That that to me I think is one of the most amazing thing things. And in general, that there are that large numbers of insects are constantly traveling in the upper region, well, I don't know if it's the upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere, but say between five, it's not, but say between five and 15,000 feet, you have these large numbers of insects that are, that are traveling in the air constantly. Um, and that they're doing it not, not in any, any sort of passive way, but, um, or to a certain extent, I guess some of them would be doing it in a passive way, but there's a lot of them who are doing it really in quite an active way. They're, they are, um, they're leaving a place because they want to leave it. They want to find a better habitat, um, or they want to find more resources, and they get themselves taken up, taken up by the air, going into the air currents, um, and then they can bring themselves down at a certain point, or they have ways of getting themselves down, down to, down to the ground at a certain point, and that that to me was was pretty mind blowing, um, the invisibility of that, um, and yet yet it's um, its existence as a as a widespread phenomenon. In general, I'd say the, something that continues to fascinate me from doing this book is, is just the, maybe the obvious, the obvious thought that insects live in an entirely different world from us. Um, their senses are completely different. Um, there's probably a lot more um, synesthesia going on, combination of senses, than, than we have. Um, and they're obviously much more sophisticated and much more sensitive to, to touch, say. Um, and they see in very, very different ways from us. So it's not so. After after a while of doing this, I've I've come to think that it's not just that um, they experience the world in a different way, but the world that they move in is actually an entirely different world from the one that we live in. So we tend to think of us of the world that we live in as as being the world because we experience it in a certain way, and we assume that it has this objective reality that is is the world. But to to animals who live in a completely different, say, a completely different time space, have a completely different time from time sense of time from us, completely different sense of space, um, and who whose relationship with the world is entirely different, they're actually they actually are, to all intents and purposes, living in a completely different world. And our paths interact, you know, and we we meet each other in all kinds of circumstances, obviously, but we are we're meeting across almost like across dimensions. You know, we're living simultaneously in entirely different environments. Um, the you know the 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 things that we touch and the forces which we're subjected to are really entirely different to these to these other beings, um, and we also are obviously completely different to them. You know we move it to a housefly we move at a glacial pace, which is why it's so difficult for us ever to swap one. Um, they see us in completely different ways, um, and they they sense the air in a very different way. Um, so that that to me is something which is you know this sort of I guess ontological differences have been things which I've been thinking a lot about in writing this book and trying to get to grips with in some way. So I have a question. Uh, so when we uh, look at ants and stuff, they look like, the, they're not individuals, but they're like part of a one body, like a blood cells. Like not every ant really has a mind of its own, but the whole colony has a mind. Mm. And do you think like there's some kind of a in a different dimension, like you mentioned, that ants actually, the whole organism is a single organism instead of each individual other. Yeah, yeah. Whether so, think about ants say as as super organisms that so rather than working as individuals, but but collectively they they produce some kind of intelligence collectively rather than individually. 
Yeah, and, and a lot of people do think, do think this, is, this is the case, that some of these animals really operate on quite simple algorithms individually. But when you, when you put them together, then there's, there's some sort of synergy that produces some, some greater, say greater intelligence, um, that intelligence that is greater than any individual, that there's something, and, and people working in artificial intelligence have worked along these principles in, in making, and people work making robots, for instance. Um, I'm, well, one, one, let me give you one example of this that I found sort of, that I found kind of interesting, which is the work that a, um, a sound artist called David Dunn has done huh, um, with, he's, he's recorded, a few years ago he recorded the sounds of insects in ponds and um, so a community, of, a community of water insects inside a pond. And at first when you listen to his recording, and I, and I guess I should say that first of all, no, but I don't think anybody else had ever done this before, which seems surprising, but people have, there's very limited set of insects that people have actually done research on. Um, and very little research has, done on, has been done on insect sound communication, even on insect hearing. Um, because, but because he's a, a sound artist, obviously this is what he's been interested in. So he, he's recorded the sound of insects in ponds, and when you listen to it, uh, at, first, at first you hear really a lot of, a lot of sort of unconnected, dis, you know, disparate kind of noises or sounds, a lot of clicking and a lot of buzzing, this, this sort of thing, whirring, things that sound like static. And after time, as it builds up, and it's partly the way that he's put the recording together, but as it, as it builds up, you start to hear this very, very complex, um, very complex sort of polyrhythmic, polyrhythmic um, sounds emerging. And the, you get a sense, the sense of a very, very dense, dense activity going on. Um, now, as a, as a musician, he, inter he interprets that as this very high level of communication that's happening. I mean, he, he, what he hears in it is, is, he hears the rhythms in it. He hears this, this, this complex rhythmic activity going on. And he hears, he hears some insects responding to other insects in that. And he thinks of the pond itself as producing some, some kind of, or the community within the pond as producing some sort of communicative intelligence which is happening within that. You know, this is of course very speculative. Um, I'm, I'm you know, having done, having done this research, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to these ideas. The part of it that, that, that makes me pause a little is the assumption that's often in there that individually these insects aren't particularly interesting or these, these beings aren't particularly interesting. It's only when they, they get together that something significant emerges out of, out of the collective. So I like the idea that something significant emerges out of the collective, but I'm, but I'm less convinced that individually there's, there's, nothing go there's nothing going on and that they only have, they only have any, any significance when you, put, when you put them together. But there are certainly, there's certainly ways that um, insects and social, I guess we're talking about social insects here in general. Um, well, actually, I'll get back to that, but, but in terms of the social insects, that collectively they, they're, they're able to produce pheno phenomenal things. I mean, if you think of termite mounds or ants' nests or the kinds of decision-making processes that bees are able, bees are able to go, to, go through, there is there's the ability to cooperate to produce remarkable collective collective um, efforts and, and there's just collective achievements that they're able to do. And they're able to do it in general, um, w say within an individual hive or an individual nest, in a very cooperative way. I mean, generally they're able to reach consensus after what appears to be a process of debate and discussion. But it seems also that um, there's a lot of communication that goes on between insects of different species, either communication that is to um, warn other insects off and to um, you know, sort of, sort of defensive kinds of communication, or there's also kinds of communication that goes on to coordinate behavior among species. And the communication is down through vibration, through chemical connections, all, all, kind, all kinds of things. And it's, been an, it's an area which has been very little researched, I think. And the parts, but the parts of it that I've been quite in, become quite interested in lately are the ones that people who, ones that have been investigated by people who haven't had, haven't had biological training so much, but have, have, have brought ideas, I mean, particularly like David Dunn, who've brought ideas from a different, from a different domain, because, you know, as a musician. And he started to see, started to see forms of communication that have not been visible to, to insect scientists who've been really caught up in chemical communication and looking at chemical cues from, from um, that insect, you know, pheromones, alamones, and these kinds of things, caramones. Um, that's really dominated the study of insect communication for the last 
30 or 40 years probably. Um, and um, so it's interesting to me that people who come with very, very different training, very, very different way of thinking about it, have started to be able to find um, new, kinds of, new kinds of interactions that just have been outside the paradigm of, um, of investigation for the, last, for the last period anyway. Yeah. Thank you. I know you spent quite a bit of time in the tropics when you were writing an earlier book, Amazonia, and I was yes. wondering if you have impressions from your memories there about the, whether there's a different place in the world that insects have in the tropics than in where we live in the temperate zone, and whether the relationships between humans and insects seem markably different thinking back on huh. it in Thank that you. way. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, he's asking whether or not in... Um, the first research that I did was in Amazonia, in a, on a small community at the mouth of the Amazon. And he's asking whether or not there's a different kind of relationship that people have with insects there than you would find, um, you'd find here, and um, in the tropics in general. Well, one thing, I've, one thing that I've been thinking about recently in that respect is that, um, I'm not sure whether this answers the question in the way that you'd, in the way that you'd want, but people, you know, I've been, I've been struck by, as I've, as I've been going around and talking to people about this book, um, that one of, the, one of the topics that comes up again and again is people's revulsion to certain kinds of insects, um, particularly to cockroaches, and people talk a lot about their, you know, the, about their instantaneous, in, instantaneous reaction to just sort of lash out and, and crush, crush a roach. Um, and I think this happens in California. I mean, I'm coming here from New York, but I think it happens in California too. But, you know, there's this sort of immediate, immediate response. And, I, and part of that, I'm, I... I, th I think is because of the ways in which we control control our living space and our determination to keep it as free as free from the kinds of beings that we don't want in there as possible, um, and to just sort of to manage it in the, in in these very strict ways. In when I was um, when I spent time in in the Amazon, people had a very different relationship to well, say the cockroaches particularly, but to things coming into their living space in general. I mean, unless the, unless they were animals which are actually going to cause them personal personal pain or other kinds of problems, they really weren't too bothered by them. Um, and also when I was living there, I wasn't bothered by them either. And partly that's to do with the ar architecture of the spaces. Spaces are much more open, um, and they're much more open to the elements as well, or at least the ones that I was in. Um, so uh, so pe and people aren't kind of trying to control what goes in and out in, this, in, the same, in the same kind of way. So, you know, if there were snakes came in the house, you know, poison snakes, people were really bothered by that. When vampire bats came in the house at night, people got very, very worked up about that, you know, actually, which I was kind of grateful for. And when, you know, when there's, when there's mosquitoes at certain time, these times of the year, when you have like clouds of mosquitoes and you can't even sit still because they're so, you know, because they're just biting you so badly, then people took, you know, as much action as they could against them. And what they would do is set smoke off going in, in their houses to just try to get rid of them, which actually was as, almost as uncomfortable as the mosquitoes themselves. But, um, but roaches and things like that, you know, they don't, really, they don't really do us any harm, so nobody really was very bothered by them. They just scuttled around and everybody just ignored them. Um, and so this, this is, I mean, I feel very strongly, this is, a, this is a cultural reaction that we have to them. It's not, it's not something that's hardwired, as, as many people argue, because of the shape of them and the way they move and stuff like that. There's plenty of places that you can go to where people don't respond to them in this, in this aggressive and negative way. And it's fairly easy to train yourself not to, not to do that. Um, but you know, spend a bit of time looking at them, seeing how interesting they are, and you know, trying to, I suppose, if you've got an interest in it, trying to retrain yourself not to just respond so immediately. Um, so just one last question, which sure. uh, in reading the book, uh, the theme of taxonomies keeps coming up, yeah. uh, and uh, seeing the world, seeing the macro through the micro and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about that and that way of seeing insects and seeing our sort of the world around us. Yeah, um, he's asking about um, taxonomy in general and relationship between large, large things and small things and seeing, seeing large things out of looking closely at small things. And s I would say in terms, of, in terms of taxonomy, one thing that I think I've learned from the book is that we use the taxonomies that, we use the taxonomies that work for us. So taxonomies seem to be, I like to think we use the taxonomies that work for us. Taxonomies are very, um, are very instrumental. So a scientific taxonomy is a very useful thing if you're trying to understand evolutionary relationships. 
And so it's a very useful thing if you want to understand, um, if you want to, say, say, develop conservation programs and this kind of thing. But if that's not really your interest, if you're interested instead, say, in training crickets to fight, then it's not really much use to you to know that there are two species, there are two species of crickets, and that's really what you need to know, and then you want to protect those crickets because this, this is their behavior and whatever. It's much more useful to know that there are 108 different, I don't know, 108 different races and 72 personalities, and they have the, these different qualities, which has no relation, you know, this is a classification system which is actually much more complicated than a Linnaean, Linnaean classification system and has, has no relation to it, but is much more useful if you're trying to, trying to train crickets to fight or trying to judge crickets to fight. So, and of course in, other, in many places people have classification systems which rely on, which rely on size, so they might classify things. You know, in a, class, in a system which would include insects, it might also include seashells or grains of sand or other small things or say distant airplanes or something like that. You know, there might be, it could be a system of things, tiny things that move or tiny things that don't move or whatever. Um, and it partly depends on, on what you're trying to get out of that system, what it's useful for. Um, that tends to be how we organize the world. Um, but, but the other part of your question about um, finding large things and small things, yeah, I, I, I think this is, a, this is a very helpful way to look, at, to look at this book and to think about what I've been trying to do. Um, and again, I go back to tell you about somebody, somebody who I talked to who had interesting ways of thinking about this, which was a, who was a, um, Somebody you might know, a neuroscientist, a Japanese neuroscientist called Yoro Takeshi, who's he's well known in Japan for not just for his neuroscience, but because he's written these popular books of, of social criticism about Japanese society. And he's also a he's also an insect collector, and he, he collects weevils and other kinds of beetles. And he has he talks about people um, he talks about people having mushy eyes. And mushi is a Japanese word for insects. It's actually another type of classification, but it includes insects. But it would include spiders and all kinds of things. Um, and he's friends with Hayao Miyazaki, you know, the um, anime, um, the filmmaker. And both of them were um, obsessed with insects as children. And in Miyazaki's movies, you can, you can see very clearly his, his interest in insects. And it, and it continues, if you think of something like... Um, Nausicaa and other, other movies, there's, there's very often these very positive representations of, of insects in them, or insect-like beings, you know. Um, and they both have argued that, that, these, that insect eyes are something that you can develop from this close attention, to, close attention to insects and spending time with them. And the kind of attention that you get from really looking at something very, very small and recognizing that for that small thing, um, there's a tremendous amount of variation in the world. So that even the category like insects itself just does, well, this might not be the way to put it, but something like, you know, I want to say something like does, does violence to the individual insects involved, but that might not be quite, quite, I mean, it probably does, they would say probably does more violence to us than to the insects because we don't see the variety. Um, and a category like insects or like nature, they're just so general that we lose that sense of the individuality of the, of the, um, of the beings. And one of the things that um, Euro said to me was that, you know, for, for each insect, it's not just that every tree is different, but every leaf is different. And that if you can develop that kind of attention to the, to the difference and the individuality of, of things, then... Um, in his mind, that, that can also extend to more of an appreciation for the individuality and differences amongst people and more, more, more sort of tolerance and respect for people that you can also have from um, your relationship with, with insects. But you can also see how l the effects of more large-scale things, say something like climate change, has an effect on tiny, tiny things too. If you're, if, you're studying, if you're studying something as small as insects, then you can see the effects of these large things on something like an individual leaf, rather than, say, just on a forest. And that will give you more of a sense of, of the intensity of the effects and the, and the breadth of the effects as well. So that's, that's one of the ways in which you, you start to see the, um, the relationship between large and small. For other people, of course, you know, tiny, tiny things are the best place to see a microcosm of the whole universe because it's in there that you see the tremendous detail and, and um, just, I suppose, like the wonders of mysteries of all things in many ways, right? I mean, because as you get smaller and smaller, it becomes actually harder and harder in many ways to explain things. You might say, well, it's all, you know, it's all DNA or it's all whatever. You know, you might find the, the tiniest molecular 
molecular unit you can find that will be the, the formative unit, but, uh, but fundamentally that really doesn't explain very much apart from the mechanics. And there's um, an awful lot of other things which, which are left out of that. So thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Hugh Raffles. Thanks, David.